Good morning. We have general questions. Question one, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to promote child safety. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the Scottish Government takes the issue of child safety very seriously and is committed to improving child safety right across Scotland through cut cross cutting policies and partnership working. We are committed to reducing the number of tragic deaths and injuries as a result of unintentional harm among children and young people in Scotland. That is why we continue to work in partnership with organisations like the Child Accident Prevention Trust and the Royal Society for Prevention of Accidents. I am fully supportive of campaigns such as the Child Accident Prevention Trust Child Safety Week. Uh, it gets the message across to parents and children in a fun and engaging way helping parents learn how to fit safety into their busy lives. And I was very pleased to be invited to the Smile Childcare Preschool Centre in Edinburgh on the 4th of June during Child Safety Week. And I took part in the Child Safety Week activities, including taking the Bitrex taste test, the bitterest substance in earth, presiding officer, uh, to highlight the danger of liquid tab poisoning. Claire Adamson. Thank you. And my sympathies to the Minister, as I too have taken that challenge. Can I highlight the work of the Child Accident Prevention Trust and Lothian Borders NHS, in which NHS Lothian Analytical Services analyse the records of children attending local E&E departments over five years to December 2014? Their analysis of almost 19,000 records showed that there is indeed a peak between six, um, 4 and 8 p.m., hence the Tea Time Terrors um, campaign by CAPT this year, which included um, burns and injuries, question, roads and traffic accidents. Will the Cabinet Secretary join with me commending this collaborative work and an importance of accurate and appropriate data collection at a &E so that we can understand the dangers that children face? Minister. Uh, well, I certainly do. I think, thanks for the promotion to Claire Adamson, but I, I certainly do agree with um, her on the, on the substance of her point that it's very important that uh, we have evidence-based analysis of what the risks are to children, and that has indeed informed this year's Child Safety Week, and I think that's very important. I know also that, uh, that there's important work being done in relation to work with Transport Scotland on road traffic accidents for over a five-year period between 2009 to 2013, and that showed some very useful information about the peaks in accident rates for children, in particular uh, on weekdays. The peak time for child road casualties was from 3 to 5 p.m. post-school, and almost one in three, or uh, 29% of weekday casualties, took place just in those two hours. So that kind of analysis is very important to informing policy, and, and we look uh, to work with, the, uh, with CAPT to inform our future actions in child safety. Question two, Malcolm Tism. Government, what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the Scottish Parliament being able to legislate on parking on pavements and related issues? Minister Derek Mackay. Earlier this year, I wrote to the Under Secretary of State for Scotland on this matter. This Government supports the principles of the footway parking and double parking bill. And now that the bill has been formally introduced, I'm giving careful consideration to the policy and legal framework before reaching a view on the best way forward. Malcolm Chisholm. Reply, but I'm sure he knows that the former MP for Edinburgh North and Leith, Mark Lazarovich, introduced a bill in the UK Parliament to sort this situation out, and that the current Secretary of State for Scotland did assure him that he would be willing to bring forward uh, legislation, secondary legislation, uh, if the Scottish Government asked for it. So, will the Scottish Government simply ask for these powers to be transferred so that the uh, bill in question can proceed in this Parliament? Minister? What I want to uh, assure uh, the member of is that we support the principles of the bill, and I think that that's the most important uh, message that you can hear, and we will work constructively uh, with the UK Government and others to take the principles forward so that we can uh, deliver the legislation that seems to have so much uh, consensus, and I'm taking further advice on the right framework so to do. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister agree that it shows up how feeble aspects of the current devolution settlement are when the UK Government has to be consulted on whether this Parliament can legislate on banning cars from parking on pavements, and that any new settlement for Scotland should include the devolution of powers wherein there is no sensible or logical reason to reserve them at Westminster? Minister. Well, Mr Gibson wouldn't be uh, surprised to hear, of course, we support the a maximum devolution to Scotland, but it appears that there is uh, even consensus within this Parliament from other parties as well that the Scotland Bill does not even match the spirit of the Smith Commission. So I think the UK Government has a very long journey to go to respect uh, the will and the wishes of the people of Scotland in terms of what we can legislate on. 
Kevin Buchanan. Thank you. Uh, I understand that Sandra White was advised that the footway parking and double parking Scotland Bill would be outside the remit of the Scottish Parliament, and does the Scottish Government consider that the opinion of the legislation team should be respected? Minister? Well, I've tried to be clear in my earlier answers that there's, there is support uh, for the Bill and the principles within the Bill. So I'll say again that I'll work with the UK Government uh, to uh, deliver what's required to make this legislation happen and certainly the principles uh, of the legislation happen and we're looking at the, the legal framework uh, to do that. Uh, now we can uh, concur with the respect agenda, hopefully the UK Government will as well. Question three, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to improve rail services to and from Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley. Minister, Derek McCann. I can confirm that the Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley will benefit from additional rail services secured through the new ScotRail franchise. From December 2015, Kilmarnock's connectivity to Ayr, Glasgow and Girvan will be improved in that there will be two, a two-hourly service from Stranravia Ayr, calling it Kilmarnock, and also be six direct services between Glasgow and Stranra, four from Glasgow to Stranra and two from Stranra to Glasgow, all operating uh, via Kilmarnock. These services will offer greater travel opportunities and connections with the Glasgow Carlisle services. Additionally, from December 2017, the Glasgow Carlisle service via Kilmarnock will see more services on the line. And throughout the franchise period, ScotRail works closely with Transport Scotland and will continue to do so to develop, evaluate and deliver new and enhanced services for the benefit of passengers. Well, I thank the Minister for that detailed and welcome answer. Uh, one of the principal drivers that promote economic change is journey times and frequency of service. If you live in Ashford and Kent, you can make that 60-mile journey to London in only 37 minutes, albeit on high-speed HS1. But if you live in Kilmarnock, it takes two hours and two trains to get the same distance to Edinburgh. Can the Minister assure my constituent that this issue is very much part of his thinking in developing rail service to increase economic opportunity in my part of Scotland. Minister. I know that Mr Coffey has pursued this uh, issue for some time and at uh, his request I had uh, officials uh, explore the, the issue of direct uh, connections. It is not possible at this time to deliver that direct service but if we can share more information about the connection opportunities maybe that will assist and if there is any potential in the future to be able to deliver those direct services, and I'll give it further thought, but I uh, appreciate the, uh, the reasons uh, behind the request to give that direct facility uh, between Kilmarnock uh, and Edinburgh. Question four, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government how it works in partnership with Glasgow City Council to tackle homelessness and to help sustain tenancies. Minister Margaret Burgess. We have strong legislative rights for homeless households in Scotland relating to the provision of accommodation and housing support and the Scottish Government has been working in partnership with Glasgow City Council to promote the housing options approach to preventing homelessness. This approach can deliver the most sustainable solutions to a household's needs and has led to falls in homelessness in recent years, including in Glasgow. The Scottish Government will provide over £1.4 billion to Glasgow City Council this year, with the, the vast majority of the funding, including that for homelessness services, being provided by means of a block grant to be allocated by the Council to fulfil its statutory obligations, its locally identified needs and a jointly agreed set of national and local priorities. Bob Doris. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Presiding officer, I recently met with striking homelessness caseworkers from Glasgow who are not properly recognised nor remunerated for the vital work they undertake. On strike for three months, Glasgow City Council refused to meet with caseworkers for a whole nine weeks. And I understand that Glasgow City Council are now, will, are now willing to regrade some caseworkers as long as unions accept job losses within casework teams. This is an insult. Will the Minister contact Glasgow City Council to ensure that the Council is not... Uh, I've been intervened on. I just, we just have one Mr. Point Doris, just ask the question. I'm responsible okay. for ordering here, not you. Thank you, President Officer. So let me reinforce then that uh, the offer was an insult. Will the Minister contact Glasgow City Council to ensure that the Council is not compromising on its statutory duties in relation to homelessness and placing my constituents at risk? And will she support my call for the Council to re engage constructively with striking staff so that an acceptable solution can be found? Minister. Okay, um, 
I am well aware of the dispute that the member has raised, and I hope he does appreciate that the industrial dispute is a matter for the Council and its employees. However, I, I would agree that uh, we would want to see a speedy resolution to this matter and hope that the Council and the striking case workers can meet and come to an agreement on that. O on the point that the member raises, which is an important point about the local authorities, um, duty to provide services. They have a legal obligation to provide services uh, to vulnerable people in terms of homelessness. And I am aware that the, the, the independent Scottish housing regulator is in contact with senior council officials to ensure that the continued delivery of services to homeless people uh, continue during uh, the current industrial dispute, which involves the homelessness caseworkers. Alex Johnson. Well, the Minister rejected my proposals for, uh, ten uh, for tenancies and support during the last housing bill, will she consider the possibility of not only introducing additional su support, but also a degree of legal compulsion to ensure that social landlords provide su support for new social tenants? Minister. In terms of support for, in, in terms of homeless persons, the member will be aware that it's, it's built into the leg legislation that local authorities have a statutory obligation to provide support services to those that need it, uh, that present as homelessness, and that obligation still applies. In terms of support provided to any new social tenant, all local authorities have to det determine the level of support that's required, and it is their decision whether or not they, they wish to provide those services. Question five, Bruce Crawford. I thank the yeah. officer to ask the Scottish Government how important the condition of local road next works is to the success of the economy. Minister Derek Mackay. Scotland's road network is a key enabler of economic growth, and this government is working with all 32 local authorities to ensure a road remains safe, efficient, and effective. Bruce Crawford. Thank you. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that before the SNP formed the administration of Stirling Council between 2008 and 2012, the condition of local roads in the Stirling area were considered to be 30th out of 32 councils? But through additional investment, the SNP administration significantly improved Stirling's standing. Is he further aware that since the Tory Labour administration took power in 2012, the condition of local roads in Stirling is again deteriorating? They have now cut the budget by 30% or £1.7 million. Is that not unsatisfactory? Minister. Well, first of all, I would advise Mr Crawford, I'm not a Cabinet Secretary, I'm just a mere Minister. Oh, however, however, oh, can, I, can I thank the Chamber for that support or that empathy? But in terms of the... In terms of the investment priorities, there is an issue uh, around uh, roads uh, investment, and I would... Uh, share the concern, and that's why we're working uh, to collaborate with local authorities around future roads investment and how we uh, go about roads uh, maintenance. But I would ask all local authorities to reflect on the priorities that transport uh, has and be mindful, of course, that local government has had a very fair settlement from Scottish government yeah. and their settlements have been maintained over a very challenging financial period. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure the promotion's only delayed. John Scott. Thanks, Presiding Officer. The Minister will be aware of the poor condition of the A70, which adversely affects the performance of the Ayrshire economy. Will he consider upgrading the A70 to trunk road status, particularly to improve the section between Ayr and the M74 to provide a boost to our economy in Ayrshire? Minister. Well, of course, I'm happy to look at all of our investment priorities to support infrastructure and economic growth, but it would be made so much easier if the Tory government wasn't reducing our budget, uh, including a year. But, of course, we'll look at further proposals to enhance uh, the infrastructure of Scotland. Question 6, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government its view on recent branch closures announced by two of Scotland's biggest banks, the Bank of Scotland and the Royal Bank of Scotland. Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, Officer, I fully appreciate and share uh, concerns regarding the impact that these closures will have on the local community and staff of affected branches, including Paisley's Glasgow Road branch of the Bank of Scotland. It is essential that banking services are available and accessible to all members of our communities and that appropriate alternative access arrangements are put in place. George Adam. 
I thank the Minister for the answer. Does the Minister share my concern that RBS has closed two branches in Paisley over a two-year period? And, as he mentioned, the Bank of Scotland recently announced plans to close its East End branch. That people unfamiliar with internet or telephone banking, including many elderly constituents, are very worried about this push towards faceless banking. Would the Minister join me in calling upon these banks to halt these branch closures and listen to the concerns of their customers? Minister. Well, yes, I think that is a fair point, and uh, it's a point that's been made by many members across the Chamber from, from various parties. And we understand uh, that uh, not everyone in society is able to access online banking. It does not suit everyone. And I do hope that the message that I'm reinforcing now, Presiding Officer, will be taken on board by our banks when they are considering these matters in future. So I'm pleased that Mr Adam has raised it, and we will continue to ensure that these views, strongly expressed by local members across the country, are clearly communicated to our banks in Scotland. Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have listened carefully to what the Minister has to say, and I would agree entirely with his comments to Mr Adam. In my own area of Springburn, the Clydesdale Bank has now decided to close its branch suggesting that its customers can make their way to one of Glasgow's suburbs if they wish to bank one of the suburbs beyond the city boundary, I should say. Um, does the minister think that it's appropriate that people who are elderly or perhaps do not have access to the internet are forced to make those kinds of arrangements for banking when in actual fact we are struggling to make sure that everyone has access to some form of banking to allow them to access all the facilities that most of us take for granted? Minister. Well, I think Ms Ferguson makes a very reasonable point, and it's, uh, it's repeating the, the basic point that I made, that not everyone in society can do business online. And that uh, is uh, something that uh, she quite rightly raises. And I'm aware that the Clydesdale Bank have announced eight branch closures in May 2015. I'm also aware, presiding officer, uh, that Neil Finlay and John Mason have both raised members' debates on this. Following that, I wrote to the Royal Bank of Scotland communicating these concerns. And I do really think that the point I made in that letter a, which was not entirely dealt with to our satisfaction in the Scottish Government should be repeated, that banks should consult not just with communities but with elected MSPs and MPs prior to making a decision to, to announce closures rather than after the decision is made as there is a feeling that although there is a three-month consultation period in most cases, this is something of a formality. Question 7, Jane Baxter. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on Police Scotland introducing charges for community events in Fife. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, Police Scotland follows the standard approach to setting charges for public services as set out in the Scottish Government's Scottish Public Finance Manual, which is full cost recovery. The establishment of the single police force on 1 April 2013 provided the opportunity to put in place a consistent charging policy for policing services across Scotland. Police forces have always been obliged to charge for their services. Prior to the establishment of Police Scotland, the eight legacy forces all had agreed charging rates, but the application of these rates and associated charging methodologies varied. This approach was inconsistent and led to an unfair situation where some events were charged different levels depending on where they were taking place. Jean Baxter. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I am sure he will agree with me that people who volunteer to organise events that enrich our communities should be supported and that barriers should not be erected to such events taking place, particularly at short notice, as has happened in several instances recently. Will he agree to take these concerns to Police Scotland and demand that they at least take into account the size of the group and its purpose when they are implementing such charges? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I can assure the member that uh, I can assure the member that that's the sort of thing that Police Scotland do, and it's important that event organisers engage with Police Scotland at an early stage in order to consider any policing requirements that may uh, be required. I should also add that there is a significant level of provision for abatement in any charges. So, for example, many community events will actually attract 100% abatement, so no charges will actually be levied for them in the first place. So there is flexibility in the system and it's important that local event organisers engage with the police not only to minimise any potential policing charges but very often there may not be a need for policing in the first place with appropriate stewarding being provided. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one.